All right. Uh, so the subject of today's hearings is this proposed constitutional amendment, and I let me outline before proceeding. So I shall start by uh, presenting uh, the links between constitutions and markets. We're a business organisation, after all. Second, I shall point out that constitutions are not legitimate foundational documents because they have been adopted in a certain way, procedures, but they are fundamentally of a certain basic structure. And third, I shall point out that expropriation without compensation, if properly understood, is confiscation and therefore incompatible with the basic structure of uh, constitutions. Fourth, uh, I shall consider whether replacing the words expropriation without compensation uh, if you replace that with expropriation at nil compensation, does that change anything? And finally, I shall make recommendations to the committee, but also consider the consequences of passing the proposed amendment bill in terms of what that would require from civil society as a sustained public program. So first on the relationship between constitutions and economies. Markets and economies, uh, as the Post-war economist Belian Rybke reminded us they do not exist in a vacuum. The market economy is a form of economic order that is correlated to a concept of life uh, and a socio-moral pattern and it can thrive only as part of and surrounded by a constitutionally minded order. Now what the, that economist Mr. Rybke did there was uh, elaborate on the setting of the market but explain why there is a fundamental link between constitutions or constitutional orders and economies. Without a constitutional order, the market economy cannot exist. And without a market economy, there is no prospect for South Africa as a place where people can thrive. Now, second, there is the basic structure of constitutions. At first glance, what is debated is whether the constitutions should be amended to facilitate expropriation without compensation. However, that, that is a superficial uh, phrasing of the question because it obscures a more fundamental issue. What we'd like to submit is that what is really in question is the constitutionality of the South African constitution. It sounds like a paradox, but constitutions, the text, can be unconstitutional. And understanding this is essential for two reasons. First, for resolving the debate in an acceptable way. And second, for developing the ethical and moral foundations upon which, should the proposed amendment take place, civil society's unremitting refusal to accept that state of affairs and its efforts to restore a constitutional order can rest. On the face of it and in our present context, a constitution is the foundational legal text of a state, in this case South Africa, as adopted and amended from time to time. But if we scratch under the surface, the issue becomes murkier. Almost at once it should be asked whether it is sufficient for the legitimacy of a constitution simply that it passes formal requirements, simply that all consultations are committed uh, properly and that the voting is done in the stipulated way. Uh, the, 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 that can never be justification enough for a constitutional amendment. Uh, if we say that it can, then uh, we open ourselves up to a tyrannical implication. Um, and that is that the legitimacy would simply be a question of administrative criteria. This is an unacceptable view of constitutions and it is a formalistic con conception um, that should dissuade anybody uh, reasonably interested in promoting constitutional orders of such an avenue of action. So contrary to the arbitrary conception of constitutions, Sarklicha submits that there are fundamental requirements of content to which any constitution must adhere for it to be a true constitution. Now, constitutions the world over vary considerably, but our, in our written submission, you will find the work of Professor Kurs Malan, who reminds us of the essence of constitutionalism. He says that it is the proper structuring of political power in the pursuit of just, justice for the polity as a whole. And it rests on two critical foundations. The first is citizenship, the ability of, of, of participation on an independent and equal footing with other citizens in governing the polity. Uh, and second is a dispersal of power. If it wants to be more than a decree, a constitution has to structure a dispersal of power uh, broader even than the trias politica. The need for a dispersal of power is recognized widely by all modern day constitutional law scholars. And in the absence of a proper dispersal of power, we find the specter of absolutism, the unrestrained ability of governments and states to intervene um, without the checks from civil society. 
And any government, uh, any introduction of a power to expropriate without compensation on the, on the, on the side of the state uh, would be uh, incompatible with constitutionalism uh, itself. In fact, um, it detracts individually from the ability of one or more citizens to participate with his or her property, but without compensating them for that detraction. And that is to treat people as if they are criminals, as if the subject of our of our investigation is asset forfeiture and reassign that ownership to the state. So this detraction and treating uh, of, of confiscation as if it is, as, is asset forfeiture uh, is absolutely at odds with constitutionalism. My third point is that expropriation without compensation is confiscation. I've already used the term confiscation once, but the term expropriation without compensation has gained widespread use over these past three years. Legally speaking, it is more accurate to consider this as a case of confiscation. That is the type of legal action uh, relevant here. Now, it is true, as many have pointed out over these past three years, that expropriation is an accepted power of states. But without exception, this power is accompanied by the obligation of payment, usually not only for the market value of that property, but often also uh, of a solatium, that is an amount over and above market value as consolation for the loss of property. Expropriation, legally speaking, is therefore a concept that is always linked to a remedy in the form of payment for what a property is worth at a certain point in time. If we sever that connection between the the, the value of the property and the deed of expropriation, then we are talking decidedly not about expropriation, but confiscation. confiscation. And the term expropriation is, is therefore mistaken, as both Professor Kursmalan and Professor Henny Stradom uh, elaborates in our written submissions. Now it follows, and it is important to point out that insofar as any act of expropriation is with compensation, but below market value, Below market value, that shortfall also confiscate, con constitutes a confiscation, uh, albeit a partial one. This is not to say that there are not more or less desirable patterns of ownership and that matters of justice uh, do not necess necessitate reform. Uh, the answer, though, is to persist with a long and hard way, the maint maintenance of a constitutional order and the rule of law, but just with more urgency and competency. And I can cite many examples, but the existing land restitution program, um, free market land reform, providing title deeds for property owners, um, where they were denied this before, but they already hold the, uh, the property in all that name, uh, the privatization of state land, these are all um, possible ways of uh, uh, addressing land reform without endangering the constitutional order itself. Now, fourth, uh, I want to speak about obfuscating confiscation with alternative terminology. And I want to suggest that we might be dealing with a public law legal fraud, uh, a case of Fraus Leges. Uh, in more recent times, certain participants in this debate and even the wording of the draft amendment bill jettisoned the word expropriation without compensation and replaced it with expropriation at nil compensation. Now, this change was apparently introduced as if it matters substantially, when in fact it has no substantially different consequences. That means that it is an attempt to pretend that expropriation without compensation does not exist in South Africa, when in fact that is precisely what is being introduced. And I draw in, in the next few paragraphs from the work of Mr. Martin van Stad and a legal fellow at Sarkelicha. Doing formally one thing when in substance an alternative is attempted is, fraudulent, is a fraudulent endeavor. Fraus legis, uh, defrauding or evading the application of law is a doctrine well known to students of private law but its application within public law, including constitutional law, remains largely unconsidered. But I think that it is something this committee should consider. While the public and legal debate is generally concerned with expropriation without compensation, the bill's wording is for expropriation at nil compensation. And by, but by Parliament's own admission, this is a distinction without a difference. Compensation and expropriation are legally and conceptually married. And as a result, it would be impermissible to expropriate without compensation. Instead, no compensation will be paid. But how does this current legal affair uh, comport with the substance of over, with the substance of a form principle? And so Fraus Legis now is at issue. The substance of no compensation is expropriation without compensation. 
or as I pointed out earlier, confiscation. And attempting to conceal this fact in formality and thereby attempting to evade the full inspection and constrictions of law and constitutionalism it is submitted is an instance whereby Parliament would be inviting action in fraudem legis. And whether Parliament considers it itself in, uh, in fraudem legis or in fraus legis is doubtful. But even if the Constitution uh, 18th Amendment Bill is adopted into law and Section 25 of the Constitution is amended, the courts must construe nil compensation for its substance, meaning no compensation whatsoever, and have regard to whether such an arrangement satisfied the just and equitable standards set in Section 25.3. The only difference, the only difference between expropriation without compensation and expropriation at nil compensation, since they are both instances of confiscation, are the incrimination of Parliament for action uh, inviting infraudem legis. To, to conclude, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, my recommendation to the committee and some public consequences we face uh, on the way forward. Uh, the state of affairs leaves Sarkaliga, business in general, and the public uh, in a, a sort of a predicament. We can never accept the proposed changes to the South African constitution, these changes. We can never accept them, no matter how many times they are adopted in Parliament, no matter how well uh, they are formalistically and procedurally um, uh, followed through. Amending the Constitution to facilitate confiscation would jeopardize the material basis on which citizenship and the dispersal of power, the two essential attributes of constitutionalism, rests. So should confiscation, regardless of whether it is called expropriation without compensation or expropriation at nil compensation, should that be written into the text of the Constitution? It would trigger certain obligations on our part and I believe on the part of all bona fide actors in society. These uh, obligations flow from the fact that the text of the South African Constitution has been changed in a way that delegitimizes the constitutional order insofar as those changes are given any effect. By nature of this change, we would be obligated by the requirements of constitutionalism itself. We would be obligated, as would others, uh, and also in the pursuit of a flourishing society to which we are committed, to set in motion a sustained campaign to remedy the unconstitutionality of the South African constitution and restore constitutionality. It would be incumbent upon, upon all constitutionally minded people to put their full effort as never before behind the restoration of constitutionalism and in opposition to those who undermine constitutionalism. While ethically and morally necessary, it would lead to tension between the various communities in South Africa, regrettable and unnecessary and unaffordable tension, because the actions in defense of constitutionalism will be made suspect and attacked in racial terms. As a business organization, Sakhalicha will act to play the greatest role it possibly can to restore the foundations to order and prosperity in the country, as well as harmonious relationships between different communities. So this submission, Mr. Chairman, is one that focuses on substance and not on form. Sarkaliga submits that the constitution cannot be amended to facilitate confiscation as contemplated and remain a true constitution. It will lose its legitimacy insofar as it is so amended, and it will regain that only after such an amendment is undone. So I recommend to this committee that it reports to parliament that it was unable to propose an amendment that makes explicit provision for confiscation because confiscation could never be implicit in the constitution proper and introducing it would produce an unconstitutional order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.